Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, uh, back for the second part of the A3010 repairs. We looked at the first two in the previous video, there were a few issues we didn't uh, quite finish looking at there. Uh, there was a, a fault with one of them that uh, you'll see coming up shortly. Uh, the floppy drive was still rattling on one of them, that was driving me nuts, making a kind of grinding noise as the disc spam. But in general I just needed to finish uh, cleaning them up, do a CR2032 mod, you know, a battery mod, and take a look at the third one which is given a red screen. There will be a part three, maybe a part four, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be able to fix the one with the red screen if I'm honest. I don't have a high level of confidence right now because I don't really have any clues as you'll see. So we've got a third one here. Uh, as you can see this is missing a keyboard but we do have a spare keyboard although the ribbon is damaged. Uh, now there was this uh, note here in French. Um, A3010... Uh, New in 2000, new what does that mean? Battery new, yeah, battery new in 2016, I think. One month maybe. Uh, pins, duh, 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 no idea. Uh, no idea. Post down below uh, if you uh, know what that means. Obviously, I can look that up, I can research that. Um, I'm guessing the battery was replaced and. Uh, Maybe something happened after a month or something, I don't know. So, let's try and get inside this one. So this one might be a bit easier because we've got this gap here, it can uh, help us I think. So you just need to just literally push these in, careful not to break them off. It's easier said than done. We'll just check the three screws, there might be three screws under here, let's just check those aren't screwed in. Yeah, there's a couple of screws in the corners here, look. Yeah, so I sort of stopped myself in my tracks there and I thought, let's just have a look at the front first. And I did the three screws at the front and then realised you can lift it up, it hinges like that at the back. Yeah, so with this one we've got a crazy battery installed here, so we'll remove that. But there is, you know, there's some corrosion on the components around here, so I wouldn't be surprised if the floppy drive is playing up. Uh, again, corrosion here. Uh, now I've got some of these caps so I can replace these caps here, maybe clean up those ones. These ones here are worse affected. And this little uh, thing here, I'm not sure it is, resistor pack, RPA. Yeah, so this resistor pack, the contacts there look awful. I would certainly clean those up and maybe try and reflow them. Uh, everything else kind of looks okay around here. There's a little bit of corrosion just there, I think. But the rest of the board, I think, is looking good on this one. A little bit of corrosion on top of the modulator shield there, but... Uh, not actual uh, corrosion rust rather, you know, typical rust. So looking at the plug on this one, can you see what's happened to that? It's black. Yeah, that is well and truly corroded. I'm not sure I'd even feel safe using that, but anyway, I'm going to uh, get the wire brush onto that and the fiberglass pen, see if I can clean that up somewhat, and we'll give it a go. I'm not really sure what the inside of it will be like, whether it's safe to use, but I'll give it a try. Because what I want to do is uh, see if I can just uh, power this up, see what happens with it. Ah, this is going to be beyond this. This is definitely going to need a new plug. Look at that. That's, that's terrible. Yeah, so don't necessarily do as I do on these videos. Research things yourself uh, from multiple sources before you do anything. Uh, you know, in terms of safety, take safety very seriously. My recommendation with something like this is to, uh, well you can't, you know it's sealed this isn't it, there's no screw. My recommendation would be to chop it off here and put a new plug on it. But you can see the rust on this is super thick. So I'm using the wire brush here initially to scratch this off. Again I'm accepting my risks here, you know the risks are this might not be the safest uh, thing to do. But if I get all the rust off, use the, uh, look at some metal polish here, I'll show you some metal polish. I'm going to uh, try and polish these up, see if they'll come up any better. Because you can see there, that's looking a bit better. You know, I've got most of the rust off that earth contact there. The top still needs to go in over. Um, it would be far easier and safer to just replace it. So a ton of corrosion off there. You can still see the very dark. So I'm going to go at this with the metal polish here. This is, uh, from what I understand, you know, the liquid that's on here is kind of like, uh, I think it's an acid and it's designed to work with the metals, you know, so it helps, as you can see, can you see how much cleaner that is? Helps eat into the surface there, eats the oxidization and corrosion and rust and whatever else is on there off, uh, and just helps bring it up looking super clean. So about 10 minutes later, you can see it's looking a bit cleaner. I've used uh, some fine sandpaper here. 
the fiberglass uh, pen, you know, you can still see there's little bits of corrosion on here. I'll uh, clean this up later. I'm just wiping over this with the IPA you now. Uh, just make sure you get all of the remnants of any polish and anything that might be conductive there off. Um, it would have been far easier just to replace the plug, that's for sure. But you know what I'm like, I'm a sucker for punishment really when it comes to trying to restore things, even something as uh, cheap and uh, crusty as a plug. I will always try and uh, do my best with it. Yeah, we'll clean the external part of the plug later, but you can see, yeah, it's leaps and bounds better than it was. So I'm going to go and uh, plug this in. I'll switch it off, plug it in, and then switch the socket on and just see what happens. So we're plugged in, I'll switch it on. Well, nothing popped. Uh, let's just measure between uh, the contacts here. These probably have spades on the other ones, I've noticed. This one doesn't have them. Look at that, 5.11 volts. Can you see that? We'll check the other voltages as well. Plus 12 down here. Yeah, plus 12. Minus 12 down here. Minus 12. So in terms of supply rails, we seem okay. Uh, I'll connect up the modulator next and see if we can get any kind of display. So the interesting thing with this one is it will not tune in at all. I cannot find a channel, you know, in search. It's not finding anything remotely video. Um, so I think the next thing we do is get the, I'll get that little velum and portable scope and we'll just scope the video input to the modulator to see if it's outputting video. It may well be that this is just not booting, it's not getting off the ground, it's not initialising the video, it could be something wrong with the video encoder. Uh, and it's going to be a bit of a reach, but let's try and reach over to the video input of that. Yeah, there's nothing. That's the 5 volts. So, it's not outputting video. So after a bit of detective work, um, experimenting with the modulator, because I thought it must be the modulator, I just tweaked the TV on fine tune. And you can see, we do actually have a display there, showing different colours there. Now that might indicate a fault, maybe RAM or something like that, I don't know. Um, it's definitely got some sort of failure, this board rather than just being a little bit of corrosion. I mean, it could be corrosion that's caused, causing the failure, but... I'll just connect the keyboard up. We'll try and clear the CMOS and see if that makes a difference. So, not really getting anywhere further with this. Uh, I've checked the obvious things, like the jumpers. Reseat the jumpers, check the jumpers compared to the other board to make sure no one's been tinkering. Swap this socket to transistor, made no difference. Swap the ROMs here. These aren't the ROMs that were originally on here. Those are just the same. I mean, I can test the ROMs in the other board just to make sure they're okay. I'll do that in a minute. Um, so the obvious stuff we've done, I've even cleaned up with the fiberglass pen, you know, around the corrosion up here. I don't really see any damage, if I'm honest. It's just bad connections. I cleaned around this chip here and inspected. Cleaned around this chip here and inspected. There's a bit of corrosion here on the SRAMs, just a little bit. I cleaned there and inspected. There could be something broken around here maybe this is what's wrong with us or it could be faulty ram i don't know but the next thing i'm going to do i think is get the board out so that i can clean it up and inspect it super close on both sides you can also see i cut off the battery here just because i don't want that battery on here anyway and uh, i wanted to do that so that it wouldn't be holding the non-volatile settings and that's made no difference whatsoever So I've had an inspection, there's a few little marks of corrosion on the underside, but nothing major. So I'm now going to clean up with uh, a toothbrush and some IPA. I don't need to use vinegar because there's, there's literally no corrosion. I use a bit of vinegar up here on these things here because they're a bit corroded. But around everywhere else, I'm just going to use a toothbrush. Uh, and I'm using the toothbrush to get in between the pins, just because you never know, there could be a flake of corrosion or something that's landed under something here. Then we'll uh, mop up with uh, cotton buds. Uh, I'll do the same thing around the main processor there, you know, well, it's not really just a processor, it's just a system on a chip, the ARM250. We'll uh, give a clean around that. I'm going to do the same thing with the RAM down here because that had a little bit of corrosion on the edge of the pins. So coming back to the first board we looked at, I'm going to replace the cap there that's missing. I've cleaned up the solder points on these, but I'm now going to get some flux on and reflow those three components there first before we fit the replacement cap here. So I'm not sure how easy this is going to be, I might have to do the majority of this off camera but we'll just get a little bit of solder and just try and touch the uh, connections on this side first. What you tend to have to do with this 
is once you've tried this and it's failed miserably is then clean the flux off and scratch the surface again clean it again and try reflowing them again because I think those are just not flowing actually if I'm honest I think the solder is not melting there so as you can see the cap here has come off now the pads are alright the cap is just over here out of shot uh, I can try and clean it up and refit it, but I've got a replacement one for this as well, so I may as well put a replacement one there. These two here, the solder has flowed okay on both sides. I'm just going to continue cleaning up and then I'll reflow these two again and then fit two replacement ca caps there now. So I thought about it and I thought I'll remove that one as well, so I've just heated it with a large blob of solder both sides and pulled it off deliberately and cleaned up. Because you can see here the solder starts to reflow, these will be alright as well. It was just these ones here that were super close to the battery. So I'm just going to go look at the uh, schematics to work out what size C154, 55 and 56 are, because I think they vary. One of these is one peak of farad, another one's like 10 uh, or 100 nanofarads, not 100 nanofarads, 10 nanofarads or something like that. There's a difference between the size here, there's two different size caps used. Yes, yeah, so look at the first page of the schematics there, we're on the right hand side of the uh, first page in the middle. We're around the print support here. These are the caps. I think some of them are these here. I'm not sure. Uh, 100, uh, sorry, 1N, 1 nanofarad. Uh, and then some of the ones uh, perhaps further along are 100 picofarad. Yeah, so just check the schematics. Actually, all three of those there are 100 picofarads. They vary when you get somewhere up here. Some of the others are a different size. So as you can see, I'm going to open the blooming thing. I've got some brand new uh, capacitors here. Now, I think, I can't remember, I think I went with 0806, I'm not sure. Honestly, I can't remember. I tried measuring them uh, to see if they were right. That does look like those will fit. Let's just lob one of those there. Let's have a go. It fits in the first one uh, nearest the one that's already existing here. That will do. And we'll try and move it into position. So I fitted the first one there, just as the uh, battery ran out on the camera. It's really annoying. So I'll just do the same thing. I'll just try and get the cap into position. The flux will help to stick it down. Look, there we go. So I've got some solder onto the tip of the iron. And I'll try and do the same thing. It's very difficult to do this on camera. Um, I tend to just do it this way. Hold it down. And solder one side. Like that. It's probably not going to be as straight as it could be if you just used a bit of hot air. You could always refloat with hot air afterwards. I'm going to get soldered all over the pads and the wires and things here, but I can get that off with a bit of braid in a minute. And that's that side done. So there we go. That's about as tidy as I can get that. We've got micro scratches on the board, you know, from all the cleaning. Uh, and you can see, you know, the solder joints there could be a bit better. You know, there's a, one that's a bit of a bead there instead of like these here nicely flowed. Uh, but I think that'll do the job. So I'm just about to do the battery mod to these. You can see I've got these uh, really nice little uh, CR2032 holders here. I mean, they're pretty cheap. You know, you clip them apart. Can you see that? It clips apart like that. There's room in here for two. Now, I'm not sure if this is in parallel, so you could double up, I think. And the lid clips open, and as you can see, there's space in here for two. Um, now, I'm not sure whether they're in parallel. I can check that later, but if you close that like that now, measure out there, we've got 3.3 uh, volts roughly. And there's a little switch on here as well off and on so you could if you want to reset the CMOS that way or I don't know you know just connect the power you could do that so what I'm going to do with this is mount this here have a diode to stop this from being charged up you know it'll be one way this will power the non-volatile and I think it comes down this little trace here via this little resistor you can't quite see it there's one on the left one on the right one on the left is for the ground it goes between ground and the center point up there and then there's two battery terminals here and the one on the right hand side is the positive and as I say it comes down here I've just measured it 4.6 uh, volts roughly uh, now the interesting thing there was the battery that was on here as you can see is uh, you can see this 1.2 volts and it was being charged with 4.6 volts so that's a problem so what we need to do here is remove that resistor I'll just get the solder and get a blob, big blob of solder heat both sides and it'll come off I'll do it from, try and do it from this side so that it comes off this way that will reveal the pads I'm going to put a, I've got a little diode it's one of those um, shot key ones 
I think it switches at like 0.35 volts or something like that, 0.4, so you lose little in terms of the voltage uh, of your battery. So we'll stick that on there. I've used that on Amigas and a few other things you've not seen yet, and it's worked okay. Um, the pad spacing is very tight here, so there's not a lot of room, but I can just about squeeze one here flat on the board and just bend the pins back round and solder it between the two pads. I'll show you the end result. Yeah, and here's the diode I'm going to fit. I'll stick the part number up there. It's actually uh, 0.15 volts, the uh, forward switching voltage on it. So there you go, you can see our diode is fitted there. I use a little bit of IPA and a cotton budge to clean up the contacts, but they're okay, it's not moving anywhere there. Technically, you're better off, you know, look for the SMD version of that. I don't know whether there is one in that sort of size, an 0805 or 806, or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's not going anywhere, it's totally flush, the contacts are well soldered. So I'm quite pleased how well these uh, Archimedes have gone so far. The 3000s are going to be uh, a lot more challenging. But yeah, I do really like these 3010s, the, the sweet. So let's say we're going to get a bit of solder and flux, like I say, I cleaned these uh, pads up previously. But there might be a bit of oxidisation on there, in fact there is, because it's not flowing very well, is it? We only need a little bead of solder there, like that's flowing okay. So with that one, I've gone over with the fiberglass pen first, just to make it a little bit easier for the uh, solder and flux to buy. Sorry, you can't see that from my hand, I don't think. So again, we'll get a little bit of solder there. That's it, that's all we need. Flow that. There, like that. I'll get some more solder on there in a minute, because the perhaps isn't enough. I mean, technically, you could push it into the hole a little bit. We we'll just get a little bit more of the positive here. I'm going to need to uh, hold this, I think. Oh, there we go. And that's the positive. That's not too bad. Hopefully you can see the nice and clean. So I just need to clean up with IPA, but that's it. Job done. So I reset the uh, CMOS settings a few minutes ago, and it's been powered off for, I don't know, a good five minutes. Switch it on. You will hear. Hopefully. Normal boot sound. And as you can see, it's loaded fine. So in terms of mounting it, as you can see, I used a double-sided pad and I just mounted it on the, the few SMD chips there. Now you might think that's crazy, but these don't leak. You know, standard CR2032 will not leak. Um, and, you know, and you can, I'll sort of see if I can show you, you can clip up the uh, lid here. I'm probably just going to lose the CMOS settings doing this. You can clip up the lid there to replace the battery. Yeah, it's only stuck down with a piece of sticky sponge, but it's not going anywhere. And the main thing is you don't have to disconnect the keyboard or the floppy drive or remove the you know the whole shielding bay here in order to get access to the battery. So back over to the red screen one. Now trying to obtain the RAM chips for this uh, proving to be a bit difficult. I'm sure we can probably get some from somewhere. But what I've done in the meantime, and I can use this on the one I want to keep, uh, ordered a 4 meg IFAL uh, RAM board here. So you set the jumpers uh, according to the table here for 4 meg. Your LK20 is 2 to 3, LK21 is fitted, LK22 not fitted. And that will disable the 1 meg we've got on board on the uh, system. So this is a nice quick easy way of ruling out whether it's the RAM or not. So I've set the jumpers here to the 4 meg configuration. So what that should mean is we plug 4 meg in here, it disables the onboard. Now bear in mind we're not testing, you know, if there's a fault with this and it's outputting when it shouldn't do, uh, we would have a fault, but I don't uh, think that's the case, because I think if this was outputting when it shouldn't be doing, it wouldn't boot. Um, so you can see on the board here there's an indication that says uh, front. So you need to just carefully get that lined up. Uh, now these are really hard to get in because when you've got the separate module that just plugs in and a separate module that plugs in, those are easy to pull out. But when you've got one big bridge board like this between the two sides, yeah, you can hear, you've got to use a lot of force to get it in. My recommendation to get these out is to use uh, a screwdriver. I'll be covering this in a separate video in its own right uh, and I'll discuss the jumpers then. Uh, stick it here, just with a little gap, and prize a little bit, prize a little bit, prize a little bit, do the same on the opposite side. But those need an incredible amount of force to get out. You could very easily damage something there. But as you can see, even with that uh, 4 meg module there, hopefully ruling out the RAM, it's doing just the same thing. I've got some of those RAM chips on order anyway. I uh, might just have a go at swapping them out if uh, I don't get anywhere with it. I'm still thinking it's probably going to be either something wrong with the ARM250 or the chips uh, IC on there. 
I don't know, there's no clues, nothing gets warm, you know. And what they should be doing is flashing the uh, floppy LED. I think either on the keyboard or on the floppy drive or both, probably both I would expect. So I'm going to have a go at removing the 74HC139 there. Just waiting for the hot air to warm up. Uh, the reason being, I've tried the RAM module on here, made no difference, you know, setting the jumpers here to 4 meg. Put the RAM module on there that I'll show you in a minute. And it's just the same. So that shows that it's not the actual RAM chips. And this is just a punch, you know, it's a guess, it's a bit of speculation. Let's try and rule out RAM because, you know, we've ruled out ROM, we've swapped the ROM chips, it's just the same. We know uh, a number of things on this board aren't the issue. It could be that chips IC. It's like a, an integrated chip, you know, a, a chip that comprises a few things. It's got a um, relationship to the disk drive, it's like floppy controller built in, and some communication stuff, you know, serial parallel. So it could be that. It could also be the ARM 250. This is one of the things I don't like about a system on a chip. You know, you've got everything in the one chip there, all your eggs in one basket. On the very, very early boards, from what I understand, there's like a little riser board that plugs in or something that gives you a separate ARM, an IOC, an MC, VIDC, uh, and an IOE, is it or something? I can't remember. There's an X, there's a fifth, fifth one on there, I think. Um, so yeah, maybe that's more desirable. Although the components there are clocked to run at 12 megahertz, the ones on standard uh, Archimedes, you know, the older boards and things, are uh, typically rated for eight. But you could probably clock them up to 12. I do know that you can overclock these a fair bit. You can get as much as I think 26 megahertz out of some of these. So we might have a look at that in a later video. I know it was something that uh, Zarkos was keen. For me to have a look at and I think I will do it's just a matter of finding the right uh, time to do that because I need to well I've got the RAM now I've got a RAM module the chips might be faster might be able to run them faster the overclock speed the fastest you can go is dictated by the RAM uh, that's the, is the main thing that's your main bottleneck it's pretty cold in here at the moment so it's taking quite a while to heat the uh, PCB up here oh there we go it's come off he says just it flew off so, I'll just uh, let that cool down a little bit. We'll get some uh, flux into shoulder braid. I'll just clean up the pads. And we'll get one of these new HC139s on there. Um, yeah, so I cut myself off there. The other thing is, I was probing the uh, pins here, and there's very little activity around there, mostly highs, apart from obviously the ground down here and the, the 5 volt VCC rail up here. But I think the fourth pin down, there's a little bit of weak, and I say weak pulsing, I've not checked it with the scope. So what I mean by that is on my logic probe, very little on the green, very little on the red. Now I've had that before when you get uh, a weak, uh, you know, ability to pull the signal high or low. So for example, it could have been mostly low um, and only uh, trained to go high but not able to go fully high. But again, you'd see that on a scope. I should have scoped it really, but I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose, I've got some of these. It's a two minute job to change it and we'll just rule it out. Um, but yeah, a traced on connectivity test up to a pad here, and I saw the same thing there. Um, that was why I then went, you know, did connectivity test because this one was hardly any signal here at all. It's just toggling between high and low very fast, but uh, not a very strong level. I'd expect the LEDs to be light, uh, you know, brighter for stronger uh, indication of uh, change there. It could be because it's changing so high frequency. I don't know, but I've just seen that before. So we've got nothing to lose. So I've been working on numerous things. I've actually got so much chaos going on around me at the moment, it's unbelievable. Um, so in order to quickly make progress, I'm doing some random things here. I just took off the uh, MV uh, RAM here, whatever it is, you know, the, it's a real-time clock chip, holds the uh, BIOS settings and things as well as the time and date. It uses an I2C, um, a serial interface. So there's only eight connections, and I've just removed that with hot air to see what difference that makes. I've ordered one of those anyway. I don't think that's gonna be it, but I just wanted to just see what the difference was when it wasn't in place. And I think there is a difference. It boots straight to the red screen, just watch. It goes purple and red really quick, super quick. That kind of makes me think, yeah, there's a change in behavior there. Now, whether that means a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, actually could still be that chip. Other things I might do to quickly test this, uh, I'm not sure if it's these two here, these 145s. Yeah, these are used to scan the keyboard. I'm just wondering if something's going wrong when it does the keyboard test or something. So I mean, I could just desolder those and test without those. Uh, I might do that next, actually. 
yeah I'll do that next I'll take those two off as well while we wait for the ship here um, we're just quickly ruling things out here I mean obviously scoping these would be a better idea the other thing is I'm bidding on one of these at the moment they're super hard to find but I think they're used in some PC motherboards and stuff so maybe they're not that hard to find they might be in terms of a bare you know chip a spare chip but on a board somewhere you could probably take one of these harvest one of those off an old PC motherboard Again, it's just going to be guesswork, but you know what? It's always nice to have one of these as a spare. Right now, I'm not really seeing any clues as to the cause of the problem here. What we do know is that it's processing code from the ROM. We know that much. We don't know where it's failing. It should be flashing the LED on the uh, keyboard there, or maybe on the drive, but I've tested it both ways. We get nothing. If you leave the red screen up for approximately, I don't know, 30 seconds, then goes to a black screen. And it just sits there, it doesn't do anything, there's no response, the keyboard doesn't work, you know, if you press caps lock, the lights don't el uh, illuminate. We could have a problem in the keyboard area, that's why I'm thinking about removing these here. Um, maybe the keyboard MCU's died, but it could be one of these has died in terms of it's, you know, it's not able to scan the keyboard properly, so that maybe all the keys have been registered, it's been pressed or something. But then you'd expect the diagnostics to handle it in terms of getting a flash, mind you, the flashing is going to be coming from the keyboard MCU so if you've not got that working you know so that you know this is where we could be this is where the fault could be in the keyboard area here could also be the arm 250 the system on a chip here there could be a problem with the vid C side of things the IOC the bit well the fact that it's giving no indications on the diagnostics makes me think that it would be more likely if there's a failure on here it's going to be something to do with the CPU or the actual interface to the uh, keyboard side of things so that it can't, you know, it can't give that diagnostic information. I'm not 100% sure whether we've ruled the RAM out. We tried the 4 meg RAM board on here. My understanding is because this 4 meg on that board, this should be disabled. Now, if this was outputting what it shouldn't be doing, uh, we might still have a problem. But I don't think so, because I don't think it would be running the code from the ROM if this was outputting what it shouldn't be doing. We have ruled out the 139 down here related to control of that RAM. So, and I don't see any of the bad connections, although there were some, you know, a little bit of oxidisation or something down here. I don't think that's the problem. It is very difficult to know which way to turn with this. I'm just wondering whether there's any real value in removing these. Um, you still expect it to output some diagnostic information, even if these were wrong and it was just like scanning lots of key presses all the time or something. This would still be able to output, wouldn't it? Unless the brake key was held down, but then wouldn't it be resetting? Well, maybe not. I don't know if the MCU's getting confused or something. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. This is all just guesswork at this stage. So trying to work out what the rattling was on that uh, 3010 drive. This washer was kind of like, I don't know where it was. It was wedged. It wasn't under that one there. So this needs greasing, but that washer was something to do with it. So I'm just cleaning with IPA just to make sure there's nothing on there. I don't think there is. We'll grease up this uh, spindle in a minute but again it's looking super clean I don't think this is the issue it might just be that it needed a bit of grease is that a bit of metal there flowing on that yeah a little particle of metal I think that might be what was doing it anyway uh, the carriage comes out I'll show you how to put that back in in a minute I've uh, got bits all over the place here you can see the coils there that's nice isn't it so again a little bit of grease just there I think we'll uh, take an opportunity to clean under here while we're there as well I mean bear in my mind this drive was working it was just a little noisy so I greased the uh, shaft of that just as I've slid it through here but it's all looking good from that point of view if we can just get that out we can get some on the edge of that as well I think that is the bearing for the drive oh I can't get out now just pull that back out and then this should be loose I think what's holding that in now? there we go yeah so again I'm going to get some grease uh, around this actually right let's try that let's try and assemble it now I'm guessing that washer was in the centre there. I've got some grease into the bearing there. 
Is that going to stay there? It's not going to stay there, is it? It's just trying to sit that there. In fact, what we can do is set the washer on the screw there and then join the back together like this. Yeah, there we go. And we just hold this from this side. Now, I hope these aren't aligned in any kind of way. They could be. That's too tight. Doesn't feel very loose, that, now. Well, after a lot of messing around, greasing various things, greasing the bearing, I even put a little bit of grease under there, so the screw's just fallen out. I better not lose that. Um, there is a, that gold washer goes around there. The issue, can you see this? That coil's loose. They're all fitted down, this one. It's not, it's rubbing on the drive. So I need to get a bit of glue. I'm just going to use a little bit of super glue, I think. Uh, just press it flat, leave it to hold in place, and then reassemble it. But that's what it is. There's the smallest amount of pressure from this coil rubbing on the top of that. Woohoo, I think I fixed it. Yeah, it's silent now. It was making a horrible grinding noise. Well, it wasn't that horrible, but it was rubbing. So, I'll reassemble that now. So, in order to get this back in, uh, hmm, we've got to sort of get the back part in first. Can you see this? Get these down here. Uh, and then it just kind of presses on. You've got to get it into position like that, I think. And then, you see this little bit here? It just kind of clips over there. I'm not sure if that once had a circlip or something on it. Let's try a disc in it. The interesting thing is it's ejected the disc a lot better now as well after greasing. Yeah, I think that's it. It doesn't really feel clipped in there. It feels like you could just lift this out. I'm not sure if that's supposed to have a circle upon it. Yeah, it does has a split ring. I've just took one off one of the other spare drives I've got here. Uh, we'll stick this. <clears throat> we'll try and stick this back on. The easy way to do this, probably, is to remove the flap. Let's just take the flap out. I'm curious where the other split ring went. Maybe it's still somewhere inside this mechanism. Let's just pull it out and have a look inside it. I don't know. It looked like it didn't have anything on there to start with, so maybe that was another problem with this. Maybe someone's been in this and lost that little split ring. But I think I've got some of these, so I think we can replace it no matter what and the other drive I've borrowed it from. Let's just get that back into there. Yeah, there we go. I just kind of like put it over there and pressed it down, and I think it's in place now. Yeah, it is. It's holding it. So I'll find a replacement one of those for the other one. Is that really in place? It's hard to tell. I think it is. I think it's yeah. It's just rotating round, isn't it? So that's that done. So we'll get the flat back on. We'll get the lid back on, and we'll go and see if that's making any noises now. So we've got the drive reassembled uh, using the uh, metal ball mouse from a previous video. Uh, and if we just start that, you will hear, in fact you can't hear that, drive is silent now. Can you hear? That mysterious rattling has gone. So yeah, it was absolutely that uh, coil. Because you've got to remember, the way we were looking at the coil, it was loose, you could tap it on the top, but then the, the board goes upside down. So the coil then hangs down a little bit, sags and rubs. It was sort of making a little rubbing noise, wasn't it, as it was going around. That's the sort of damage that could occur in impact, uh, you know, travel in transit. So one of the tests that I like to do on something like this is, when you do a CR2032 mod, fit the battery. And if it's a system you're going to sell, don't sell it for a month. Uh, actually test it for a month with a CR2032. Um, Certainly a week or two, and then remeasure the battery. And you know what? After a week, I noticed the battery was flat, so I put another battery in, tested it for a day or something, thought so, okay, it's okay now. Left it for another two or three weeks, came to check the battery again, completely flat, zero volts. And I thought, there's something going on here because in the other 3010, same mod, yeah, pretty much the same board, 
that's fine. You measure the voltage in that, it's been in there a month, it's still around three volts. So there's something going on with this board. Um, so I put another battery in, a third battery, left it for just 10 minutes, then measured it and noticed there's some voltage drop already after 10 minutes. I thought there's something going on here. It's draining the battery when the system is powered off. Now the first thing that sprung to mind, uh, well there's two things I thought, I need to inspect the uh, you know, the little chip here, inspect around that, um, see how that's wired in terms of the schematics, because there are a few thoughts I had, one of them was I wonder if it's not in like a low power mode or something, it's like it's all the time it's kind of in a, a more inefficient mode. Uh, you know, I wonder if there was a pin you could use to configure that, or if it was done in software. Did wonder if there was a fault in it, and you know, it was not going into the you know the high efficiency mode, um, or something like that. But I don't think it works that way. I think it's it's efficient all the blooming time whilst that's on. The other thing, looking at the schematics, is anything connected to the um, the positive rail. You know, so the battery feeds one of the connections on here to give it a voltage. You know, so three volts at the moment with the CR two or three two. Is there something, a component on there, like a cap that's gone, uh, turned into a resistor or something like that, or something that feeds it, a diode maybe. And you know what, look at the schematics, D15 is the first primary candidate before a cap, because a cap would need to be, uh, you know, pretty much a short to drain that. So it can't be the cap, I don't think. I think we'd know about it if it was the cap. The cap would get warm as well when it was powered up. Uh, so if we just uh, test on continuity test, this is the diode here. It's one of these three pin ones. I've ordered some of these. So if we just measure the uh, connections there, we've got a short. And if we measure the other way, we've got a short. That diode is shorted. So I'll show you the schematics in a minute. What's actually happening is the f 5 volts goes into the anode of that, dio uh, that diode and the cathode side is what goes to the battery. The idea being that when you've got 5 volts, you know, because this is powered, it feeds through the diode. The voltage in theory should be higher than the battery level, so it would charge the battery up and at the same time it's powering the, the thing here. The downside is when that's short, as it is at the moment, when it's off, the positive side of the battery is connected to the 5 volt rail that goes to everything else. So that's why the battery is lasting no time at all. When you switch it off, the battery is trying to power everything with uh, three points, uh, roughly 3 volts. So we need to replace that diode. Now I've ordered uh, a replacement. I'm not sure I've ordered one exactly the right size. Hopefully I have. Um, and it is just a standard diode, there's nothing going to be specific to that. Uh, I've ordered one that will uh, rate it up to 200 milliamps, I think in about 100 volts. So I think that'll probably work there. Something like a 1N4148 would probably work fine in that position there. This is going to be uh, consuming a pretty low amount of current, I would think. It's consuming the right word, uh, passing, pulling, drawing. Um, so yeah, this battery holder, the thing I will point out with these, you can see I relocated it here and because the PCB is nice and flat and you can still ex uh, you know, get to it, you know, the keyboard's not blocking it. But there are two uh, contacts here and the way I've been using these is just bending the, the contact down a little bit, bending that one up a little bit. So when you shut it, it closes those two contacts and you can just use one battery. But the other way this will work is you could have two button cells in the, in the, uh, in the uh, series. So you close the lid normally and you've got 6 volts instead of 3. Now these chips are rated up to 6 volts. So what I would suggest if you're going to do that, with regards to the diode I added over here, instead of using a low uh, drop, you know, a Schottky diode, this is like 0.15 volts, just put a standard uh, 1M4148 or a 4001 or something that's like 0.7 volt drop. In fact, a 148 is probably a bit lower. But uh, yeah, just put a standard, you know, 0.7 volt uh, drop uh, diode there because typically these 3 volt cells are a little bit more than 3 volts like 3.1 volts or something so if you had two brand new cells in there you get 6.2 volts so technically you know if you drop it by 0 0.7 you're still over 6.1 volts roughly you get away with it probably but uh, yeah I think because the other one has still got a really high voltage level despite the fact it's been in there a month I think one on its own is fine so looking back at that one that's given a red screen, I'm waiting for one of the uh, chips, uh, yeah chips, it's actually called chips, it's got chips on it, you'll see it in a minute. Um, but in the meantime I thought I'll just re-inspect this one on the underside. Um, can you see here, it's like a solder blob or something, it comes from a trace here and it's just like a giant blob. So I don't know whether we've got a fault there where something's shorting across where it shouldn't be doing, I'm going to inspect that. 
uh, under magnification maybe get some solder onto it and just see if we can clean that up and work out what it is I mean it'd be terrible if that was the fault because I've done so much messing around with this it would be <laughs> well it wouldn't be I'd be really happy if it worked but yeah I kind of suspect on this board the ARM 250 is the fault actually um, I don't know enough about them in order to diagnose it properly you can get a diagnostics from as I mentioned uh, earlier on I might have a go at trying to recreate uh, a set of those diagnostic ROMs myself but anyway we'll just uh, we'll inspect that see what that is so the thing I forgot to film was just refitting this it's very similar to that uh, HC139 or whatever it was down there you know it's just a case of cleaning up the pads with some uh, desolder braid and flux get the new this is a brand new one I've still got the other one brand new IC on there and uh, you know just carefully solder one corner make sure it's straight solder another corner and then just drag flow um, just like we did that other IC but uh, that has not solved it it's just the same so my replacement diode has arrived just testing to make sure I've got the right board I have this one's the one with the short the thing to notice some of these components have like a double diode you may have a diode on the other side let's just test that I know you can't see the meter uh, but I can perhaps show you that in a second yeah this one isn't this has just got a single diode in it as far as I can see but it's a three pin package so I've got the replacement uh, diodes here these are double diodes so I just need to as I remove this with hot air in a sec just to make sure that the uh, pads you know the uh, conduction is the right way from anode to cathode with regards to the uh, chip here you know it should be feeding five volts to the VCC pin here and in fact we can uh, just test that it's going to be one side or the other it's going to make a direct connection here probably a corner point yeah it's that one down there now the interesting thing is from there we've got a direct short but here we don't so it's a bit odd that actually how can we have short there but not there Anyway, I'm sure that's the problem. So we'll remove that diode and uh, replace it. So I've got that set to 450. Let's uh, just heat gently around here. It's not going to take much because there's only three contacts there. Could move that cap to the left of uh, that cap to the right of it. Should have stuck some captain on that really because you never know it might uh, come out of position if I'm not careful. It's taking longer than I would have expected that for such a small component. It could be glued down. Sometimes they stick a little bit of uh, epoxy or something underneath them when they mount them on the board before they solder them. Now that's coming off. Look, just carefully move that out of the way. There we go. It's stuck to the side of the crystal, but that'll be all right. Let's just uh, move it out of the way here. So I'll get a little bit of uh, flux and uh, use the desolder braid just to clean the three pads up there. And the next thing I need to do is work out which of those pads is the 5 volt connection, which we can do from the uh, 5 volt thing down here. Um, and then just make sure I get the replacement diode on the right way around. So a teeny tiny toty bit of flux there. Uh, can't see the blooming pads now because of the flux. Anyway, let's just uh, heat that. There you go, because it's nice and flat. Heat that one, that's flat. Um, we'll heat that one. There we go. So they're all looking nice and clean. I'm not sure if I've already shown you, but I'll show you the schematics in a minute if I haven't, just to, so you can see how I worked it out. But anyway, if I put the, uh, it's on continuity now, and um, we just want to work out which one of these is the 5 volt rail. It's that one. Yeah. So this is where the anode of our diode wants to go, the top right hand pad there, and the cathode wants to be down here. Let's just see which way these are connected here. Yeah, that's all right. That left-hand pad is not connected to anything. So we'll try and get one of these diodes out of here. I'm just going to lob it into the middle of the board there. Can you see it? Uh, so that's that. And with the meter on diode test, uh, I need to carefully measure this now without flipping the thing off. I'm hoping it's not that way around. Hang on. Oh, it's going to be really hard to measure this. 
even the magneticness uh, of the probes is interfering with uh, me reading this. Yeah, that's what I was hoping. I was hoping it's going to be uh, the other way around. I think. In fact, no, that's wrong. It wants to be that way around. Let's just try that again. Oh. Yeah, I'm getting nothing that way. So let's try and put the. Oh, come off. Let's put the probes around the other way. I need to flip it back over because the pins are the other way up. Yeah, there we go. So you can see we've got on the. Well, we've got two pads there. We've got the anode, and the cathode is on the single side but this one has got two you know if you measured from there to there there'd be another diode but the other pad is not connected up so that just gives me a high level of confidence that if I install this in the position up here it's got the right orientation you know the cathode is the uh, common you know the single pin the anodes are the two other pins yeah I'll inspect off camera and then I'll show you soldering it what I want to do here now is just carefully uh, just try and not touch it I'm trying to find my hand position on the board here, you know, put my palm with my hand on there. Uh, and just add a little bit of solder and flux. Crazy amount if we need to. There we go. Without trying to move it, and I think I've moved it actually, just as uh, a result of touching that. Let me just see if it needs adjustment. Yeah, it did need uh, just a tiny move there on one side. So I'll just get a little bit of uh, solder and flux onto uh, the other pin there. We've got a crazy amount of solder there. I can clean that off in a minute. Uh, hopefully you can start to see now, if we just get rid of that bit of solder there, reflow that one, reflow the those, and reflow the bottom one, you can see it is on there, it kind of looks a mess because it's covered in uh, flux obviously, so I'll just clean that up and then I'll measure to make sure it's the right way around and we'll go and test it and see what's happening. So just clean in with a little bit of IPA here. We'll get the toothbrush onto this because the you know the cotton bud can't get in between those little gaps between the component legs and stuff there. There's the old uh, one there. I've just I've still got on the board. Look, there's the old one there. Let's just get rid of that. So I've got some IPA in a, a little uh, cap here, and we can just have a little brush there like this. It kind of goes everywhere. You've got to be careful not try and flick this too much, or it will just go all over the place. Cat spotted a leaf or something, I think. Uh, if we just collect the IPA now. So as you can see, it's been replaced. It looks nice and tidy. Uh, let's go test it. So before I power this up, I want to make sure that the uh, diode reader is correct. Which it is. Make sure you've got connectivity from here to here. Which we do, and not from here. That's correct. So that should mean that it's okay now. Uh, I'm going to uh, just leave the battery uh, flap up like that so it's not powered by the battery. So I've closed the battery flap there. If we measure from uh, ground to that pin there, can you see that? Three volts. So it's charging this, but the uh, five volts comes from the anode side here through to cathode to there. So that should mean that when we power it on, it works okay. So we next need to do the inverse, we need to remove the battery, so I've done that, so the battery's not connected. And uh, measure the voltage again on the real-time clock chip. Yeah, zero volts, and if we switch it on, so we've got mains there now, the display's coming up, it's booted, and measure there, we should see five volts. Yeah, just measuring there now, we see 4.67 volts. There's a little bit of a drop from that diode. But, that is working. So we're all reassembled. Uh, let's just switch it off, hold the delete key down, switch it back on. That'll clear the settings, hopefully. There we go, that's working. So the final thing I need to do with this now is to you know, test this battery for a period of uh, days to make sure it doesn't go down. Yeah, so here's the battery backed RAM slash uh, real time clock. Uh, you can see the IC there, it's a PCF8583. Uh, now, bear in mind, you can get a dip version of that that's probably used on the 3000 and some of the other Archimedes models, and you can also get the uh, surface mount version. It's probably got a different 
code on the end of the letter, it might be M or something like that, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what I ordered. But if you look at the chip, you'll get the exact part number off it. So, if you look at this circuit here, this is the battery, BT2. Uh, it says, it, interestingly, it says 1V2, 1.2 volts. That has taken me by surprise, actually. Um, because there is 4.6 volts across it. Now, you've got 180 ohm resistor on that side of it there, on the positive. I, I think I showed you that, actually, when I was talking about the battery contacts. There's 180 ohm resistor between its supply rail, its positive, and the battery positive. And there's 180 ohm resistor on the negative, you know, the ground of the battery, and zero volts, your ground. Uh, yeah, so that's a bit strange. 1V2. I don't get that. I don't get that. So it would seem that the 1.2 volt cell that was on there, whilst not the right package, is probably, well, according to these schematics, nothing wrong with it. I am not sure I necessarily uh, agree with those uh, schematics in the sense that you've got 4.6 volts there. Um, yeah, you've got these resistors here. You've got a resistor there, so you've got a potential divider, uh, have you? I don't think you have. It's coming through this diode here, 4.6 volts there. Yeah, I don't know. Comments down below. Do you think it's a good idea to have a 1.2 volt cell there when you've got 4.6 volts here? Um, I could be missing something obvious, like maybe there is a divider there that I can't quite see. But anyway, the 5 volt rail to, to power this IC and the charge comes from here. You know, that's your 5 volts. It comes through that diode. This is the diode we just replaced. Because this diode was shorting, it means that the positive of the battery is connected up to the 5 volt rail of the entire system. So that, you know, that's what was happening, that's why that battery was only lasting hours or maybe a day at most. don't even think it was lasting hours to be honest, like after an hour I reckon it was probably going flat. So we're all done, the final thing I need to do is just clean this up, I've cleaned the other one up already. So I'll put the disc in, we're just testing here with the uh, ball of metal, and as you can see it works perfectly. It works really well actually, it's the best mouse I've got this now. Now I suspect I forgot to connect the speaker up. Oh joy, I'll have to take the lid back off and put the speaker cable back in. Yep, I forgot to connect the speaker. It gives me an opportunity to show you a few things. You can disconnect the flat flex here. You've got to kind of get your left hand thumb between, the, you know, on the edge of the first one. Carefully pull it up. Do the same on the second one. Pull it up. Carefully kind of lift the keyboard over its four points and then just slide it out like this. Be careful not to damage that flat flex. I'm showing you this from the other side here with these flat flex. So lift this one up. Try and grab this one here with your thumb like that. And I can't really see what I'm doing. You've got to try and you know pull it into position there. You've got to look over it from the other side of the case so you can see what on earth you're doing. You can see it's already been bent up on that side there a little bit. This is super fiddly to try and demonstrate. And try and push it straight down like that. Make sure it's down as it'll go. Do the same thing with this one. Grab it on each side. Left align it. Check on the right hand side to make sure you're not over. And we were. There we go. So as soon as it's in, again, same thing, hold it with your finger and four thumb, uh, your, hold it with your finger and thumb and just pull it flat. That's it. So I'm not going to bore you with all the cleaning work. I'm just going to get some IPA onto here, scrub it down a little bit. Um, this hasn't been washed in the sink, this piece. Uh, it might benefit from having a wash in the sink. I might do that now, actually, because you get bits of dirt in here and, you know, it'll just come up a bit cleaner. You know, all the little nooks and crannies, the dirt comes out with a scrubbing brush in the sink. But when it comes to reassembly, what you do is you hook the uh, things on the back like that, you know, so it hinges from the back down to the front like that, and there's just three screws hold it on the front. So a bit of IPA and friction, you can see the first half label has pretty much come off there. There's still a little bit of glue, we can clean that in a minute. But you just need to just, uh, you know, get a bit of IPA and then sort of circle around it, and it will come off. There we go, final little bits there. It's come off pretty easy that actually. It did take a minute or two. There we go. Just a little bit there, I think. Yeah, so I'll get a little bit of Maguire's plastics on there because some of these little scratches and things will come off with that. 
and uh, it will just help get off any little bits of glue that might still be there. Be careful with plastics around the printed stuff here. I'm going to get a little bit there, but just very carefully, not over the top of the print. Let's just have a little go on that little bit there if we can. A cotton bud might be the best thing to apply this with in such a small area there. In fact, let's do that. Let's just use a cotton bud here. Because what I don't want to do is rub off all of the uh, grey A and the acorn thing there. There we go, it's come off, look. There we are. That looks a bit better. So I don't expect these blue bits to come off because I think it's going to be pretty well embedded into the surface here. I'm not really sure what they use to do this. You know, a stencil obviously to make marks, but it's kind of melted into the surface. So these might be like heat, you know, melted with heat into the surface. So yeah, chances of removing these little stray lines and things here. Yeah, it's slim to on look, it's just not making any difference that. They're well and truly embedded in there. So there was a little uh, piece of the, see this edge here, it was kind of bent out a little bit away from the corner, it's had a chip in the past. So as you can see, it's got the mole grips, uh, put some super glue there, got the mole grips just holding it between a piece of the edge here uh, and the corner, so it's just pulling it in. So I'll just leave that for a few hours to make sure that that holds in place. It's only a tiny cosmetic thing, but uh, I may as well try and get as much of this perfect as I can, really. And there we go, all cleaned up and reassembled. There's very little to uh, get the lids back on these. You just hinge it from the back and uh, do the three screws on the front. And as you can see, it's gone back together perfectly. All the keys work. I've tested the keyboard a number of times. Um, so, yeah, this one's uh, good to go. And as you can see, it's working fine there. Composite video output. Now, composite's not that great. As you can imagine, you know, you get dot crawl and stuff. Colors aren't as good, it's not as clear and stuff as uh, using the, the VGA which these output. I'll perhaps demonstrate that in a minute. I'll try and connect it to a VGA monitor. The one thing I point out about the 3010, it's only got a single speaker. So that's a preferential thing on the 3000 if you get an Archimedes 3000. It has stereo speakers, it's got a speaker on each side of the case there. Yeah, it's working sweet. So I tested it on the monitor, it's like 1280 by 1024, 54 aspect ratio. You can see it's working fine there. I'm not sure if it's going to be able to display this mode or not. It's out of range, isn't it? So that's one thing to know that when you uh, use one of these with a monitor, it does need to be a proper multi-sync. This is a multi-sync monitor, but it's uh, got quite limited uh, frequency handling. I'm guessing if the control escape that, it'll come back to the desktop probably okay. Yeah. So changing the display settings to VGA there in configure, you can see that has actually worked. It's not gone out of uh, range now. It's stretched a little bit because obviously, like I say, it's a 5.4 monitor this. But that looks sweet. As you can see, I relocate the battery uh, thing here because the board here is totally flat, so this is an easy place to mount it rather than trying to stick it on these ICs here. It's totally flat, it's going to stay stuck down. So yeah, sorry I had to abruptly end the video again here. In the third part we'll revisit this uh, one with the red screen to see if I can uh, make any progress. I've got some new RAM on the uh, way, as I explained earlier, uh, although I don't think it's the RAM, I think we ruled that out. Uh, I've got a chips chip there, 
I did consider uh, doing a little bit more uh, measuring around and maybe just to make sure all the data bus and address bus connections are okay. But you never know, we might find some corrosion underneath that ram because there was a little bit on the right hand side. I'm just wondering if we've got a missing data bit or something like that there. Special thanks to Zarkos, uh, one of my patrons, for sending these to me. Can't thank you enough, my friend. It's uh, been really great working on these. If you would like to support me via Patreon, please see the link down below. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.